My name is Bradley Weatherholt. In the documentary, The Prequel Strikes Back, I traveled thousands of miles, interviewing movie critics, filmmakers, and Star Wars fans on George Lucas and his controversial prequel trilogy. The film became larger than I ever expected, and the response was incredible, though not everyone was on board. Now, a year after release, I'm at it again with the goal of covering new topics and tying up loose ends. This is The Prequel Strikes Back. Strikes Back! In The Prequel Strike Back, we discussed many of the cinematic influences on the prequels, but we barely scratched the surface. There are dozens of homages throughout the prequels to filmmakers such as Kurosawa, even the poster art draws from classical cinema. But my favorite easter egg of all is from 2001, where you can actually see the space pod from Kubrick's masterpiece stashed in the background of Watto's junkyard. Highlighting Lucas's nods to classical cinema in the prequels doesn't necessarily lead to an appreciation of the films, but it does give you an idea of the type of films Lucas wanted to make. When you view Lucas as a visual maestro, connections open everywhere. Sometimes this leads to thematically significant elements. For instance, Padme, the avatar of the Republic and democracy, wears a headpiece in the style of the Republic Order. And later, in the same film, as the Republic is remade in the image of the Empire, so too is Anakin rebuilt to that of the machine. The imagery is just as poignant. But sometimes the visual connections between the films are puzzling, almost whimsical. For instance, in Attack of the Clones, Lars mentions, 30 of us went out after her, four of us came back. In the original Star Wars, 30 rebel ships were deployed to attack the Death Star. We count 30 rebel ships, Lord Vader, but they're so small they're evading our turbo lasers. Only four returned. What does this mean? Who knows? Could be an accident, but the connections keep piling up. That believing it all an accident seems unlikely. Even the accidents were repurposed to have intention and connect the films. For instance, the original Star Wars features a famous gaffe where a stormtrooper runs into a door. Lucas saw this as an opportunity, and in Attack of the Clones, he made Jango Fett experience the same gaffe. On the commentary, he wondered, I thought, wouldn't it be funny if that's a trait that Jango has? When he puts his helmet on, he can't really see that well, and so he's constantly bumping his head and that trait gets cloned into all the stormtroopers, and that's why they keep bumping their heads. That may sound like a lot of things, but it doesn't sound like someone who wasn't trying to intricately link his saga together. In the prequel Strike Back, we showed some of the visual links between the Skywalker mentors, but it goes beyond that, all the way to the point where the characters share almost identical lines of dialogue at almost identical time codes of each movie. Yes, I need, I need your help, help son. Like their mentors, the Skywalker heroes share narrative elements as well. Take these scenes where each Skywalker makes a spectacular fall. Anakin leaps out of his ship in a flippant, arrogant pursuit. Juxtapose that with the son's desperate leap of faith after learning Vader's true identity. The visual connections, down to each individual cut, parallel each other. Even with the audio, the scenes almost completely match. It's a great illustration of how Lucas intricately connected these films on a visual and narrative level. This is Mike Climo. He wrote a now famous essay arguing that Lucas painstakingly connected his Star Wars trilogies together using a classic literary technique known as ring composition. In our original documentary, I talked with Mike on the basics of Star Wars ring composition, but this time I wanted us to explore a specific chapter in the Skywalker narratives and take a look at their scenes on Tatooine. So essentially you see these two parallel journeys, father and son, going through the same things, but ultimately making different choices. Not only are they both going on a quest to find a character, and it ultimately ends in the tragic death of a family member, you see both father and son at the same age. They're both roughly 19 years old at that point. They both venture out you know, into the desert from the same location, from the Lars homestead. We see them both actually sitting at the same dining table. We see both of them, you know, watching the twin sunset. We even see both of them, you know, traveling across the desert, you know, in these hover vehicles, right? And they actually even, they, they go into the same area. 
the Judlin Wastes. And you can then take any one of those scenes, again, and, and you can then drill down to another layer. For example, let's take the, the scene at the, uh, at the dining table. So obviously in A New Hope, we see Luke sitting at the dining table with his uncle and aunt. In Attack of the Clones, we see Anakin sitting at the table with Owen and Brew, but also Cleek Lars. Not only do you see Anakin and Luke essentially sitting in the same location, you see actors framed in, in, in similar shots. And For example, you'll see a similar three shot, but the camera angles are reversed. And then it's down to even just very, very tiny details like... The beverage even that's served in A New Hope, you'll see uh, blue milk versus the uh, the red, you know, Jawa juice that, that Brew serves in Attack of the Clones. When Anakin and Luke are at the dining room table, uh, in Attack of the Clones, Anakin, you know, is learning about his mother's fate. Thirty of us went out after her. Four of us came back. Whereas in Star Wars, Luke asks about Obi-Wan Kenobi, which in turn brings up the subject of Luke's father. He died about the same time as your father. He knew my father? Both Anakin and Luke become emotional at one point, and they get up from the table. Owen asks Anakin, Where are you going? To find my mother. Brew asks Luke the same question, believe it or not. Where are you going? Looks like I'm going nowhere. Immediately following both of those scenes, in both films, we then cut to a Skywalker watching the twin sunset from a crater just outside the homestead. And it's a, and they're both essentially standing in the exact same spot. In Attack of the Clones, we see two shadows cast on the wall, whereas in Star Wars, we see two suns setting. At this point in Attack of the Clones, Anakin actually leaves to find Shmi. Luke is going to leave very soon to find R2-D2, but he doesn't actually leave at sunset. It's too dangerous with all the sand people. We'll have to wait until morning. So at that point, we see Anakin speeding through the desert on a swoop bike. Luke will then uh, take his land speeder, and we see him zooming across the same desert. What's interesting, though, is uh, here is how Lucas uses screen direction to really emphasize you know, the differences in the journeys that they're taking. Anakin's swoop bike is, is pointed frame left, whereas Luke's land speeder is pointed frame right. Next, from high above, we see Anakin and Luke entering the same, um, the same area of the desert, the Judlin Wastes. And it's, it's interesting to point out, the Tusken Raiders actually sneak up on Luke previously. Now, in Attack of the Clones, we see that Anakin is the one who sneaks up on the Sand People and attacks them. And then comes you know, the climax of both sequences here, where father and son are suddenly confronted with the death of a family member. Shmi, she's hanging from a wooden frame. Owen and Brew, their, uh, their skeletal remains are actually laying on the ground. And both scenes actually end the same way. We see a Skywalker framed in a close-up, looking down, and then back up. But there's a crucial difference here. Luke will be able to move on from the deaths of his aunt and uncle. Anakin will be unable to let go of his mother, really bringing to the forefront the difference of the journeys between these two. They're like animals. And I slaughtered them like animals. I hate them. For Mike, the ring completes itself in the saga's sixth episode. When I think about the end of Return of the Jedi, for me, I think that's that's the point where the journeys of father and son, you know, really intersect in a powerful way. You know, now we see Anakin Skywalker, who's now facing a similar situation and a similar choice that he faced in Revenge of the Sith. In those moments, we see Anakin, who's standing next to another character who is, you know, standing over a third character uh, whose life is in jeopardy. And Anakin is faced with the decision. Only in Return of the Jedi, now his son is involved. And ultimately, you know, the fact that his son is involved will then help him, I think, make a very different decision. Knowing this about the Star Wars films may or may not give you more to appreciate about the prequels, but much more than liking or not liking individual films in the saga, it should serve as a reminder that Star Wars is unique from other franchises, in that it was designed to be treated as a whole. And when viewed under this lens, this unassuming space opera can be viewed as what it really is. Something truly spectacular. <laughs>